problems of the world could be settled easily if we were only willing to think. 65 years ago, a decade before the Civil Rights Act, our founder wrote policy letter number four, the first corporate mandate on equal employment in history. And every generation of IBMers is asked, how can we in our own time expand our understanding of inclusion? You can't be what you can't see. I think inclusion is being able to incorporate lots of different viewpoints. I read recently that IBM has more than 360,000 employees. My job is to make sure that none of their voices get lost. IBM's not defined by a product, it's really defined by IBMers. I co-chair the IBM Women's Council, which is the executive team that really sponsors women's initiatives as well as progressing women talent across multiple leadership roles, both in technology and business. This is an important moment in time to really be able to show our next generation of young leaders what it is to be a woman in tech, a senior woman in tech, a business executive in tech. To me, this is about first visible role models, because when we can see ourselves in technology, we can all build our future in it. We have literally hundreds of programs around the world that are focused on a truly global approach to diversity and inclusion. We have these online communities. I've connected with trans people all over the globe. They face different cultural challenges depending on what country they're in. But one constant is IBM is going to be the inclusive part. At IBM, we have what we call business resource groups. I'm part of the Hispanic one, and I'm part of the women's one that we have in Austin. In technology, everything is moving so fast. Having the inclusion, it makes a company more competitive. Diversity creates innovation. When you have the leeway and the permission to be whoever you want to be within a company, you can actually give your perspective and know that it's valued. The more work we do to make sure we are inclusive and we are diverse and we are the mirror of the world, the more generations of girls to come will look up and feel like they can achieve everything they want to achieve. If you really want truly ethical, unbiased technology, we need to make sure that everyone has equal opportunity to participate in its creation. You can't be what you can't see. You can be what you can't see. You can't be what you can't see. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer, IBM, Michelle Peluso. everyone, I am so thrilled to be here. So as you can imagine, throwing an event for 30,000 people in Vegas is just a little bit stressful. So many details you have to think about and plan for. And as I was leaving for Vegas, I was talking to my nine-year-old daughter, Auden Grace. And I was telling Auden all the things and the sessions about technology and blockchain and and you know, the bands that were gonna be coming in train and, and chain smokers and, and she asked me a really important question. She said, but what are you looking forward to the most? And that was a no brainer. And I told her that I was most looking forward to being with my people uh, at the Women's Networking event. So thank you so much for being here. We are, as women, only 20% of attendees. Uh, that is pretty much the mirror, as we know, of women in technology. So my big hope is that you take this time to be with some extraordinary women and men who are as committed as I know I am to making sure that the, the face of technology, the future of technology, is also female. So our first speaker understands that it takes um, really culture change to make progress happen. Dr. Patty Fletcher is helping SAP and other companies engaging leaders on making diversity and inclusion a fundamental part of their agenda. And I'm so happy to have her come join me on the stage. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Patty Fletcher.
for as long as I can remember, I have had this unexplainable connection with my grandmother, my mother's mother. My sisters and I called her little Nana because she was about four foot seven and I exceeded her height despite being petite myself by the time I was about nine. I spent the first five years with my Nana. She watched me while my mother worked every day when working moms really weren't a thing. And we had so much fun. My memories are of amazing Armenian comfort food she'd make, songs she'd teach me. But I never really understood who she was. And in fact, everything I knew about my grandmother, who I loved so much, was what my mother told me. I knew that she was orphaned at six months old due to the Armenian genocide. I knew that at the age of 19, she was finally able to immigrate to the United States because she was going to marry my grandfather through an arranged marriage. When she died in 1998, my fascination with her only grew. And so I started to try to research her life, but I couldn't. There were so many things that were missing and I knew that I had to learn how to research like a scholar instead of a business person. So at what was probably the most inconvenient time in my life, two small kids at home, my job ultimately felt like I was being paid to go on a plane and fly to paces, I decided to go back for my PhD so I could learn to research like a scholar. Fast forward a few years later, and I was about a year into my dissertation proposal, which at the time was about transformational leadership and virtual environments and net new innovations, a topic I'm still very much interested in, when I had to do a kind of check the box, check the box in this class that I was being forced, and that was my mindset at the time, to take, and it was on gender, leadership in the business world. And I rolled my eyes because I was raised to believe that feminism was about men or women, not its true meaning, which is men and women. I sat down, I listened to the class, and everything changed for me. I was introduced to Carol Gilligan. Carol is the founder of feminist leadership theory. And what I learned on that very first day was that through Dr. Gilligan's research, I found out that decision-making in business is totally different for women versus men. And that all of the constructs of how we define success, what it looks like, what it means to take us there, well, how a leader makes decisions, were all based on a model that were not conducive to women, which is why we have such an investment in programs around learn how to negotiate like a man, learn how to lead like a man, learn how to network like a man. That works for half the population, but not for the women. And so many believe that Carol Gilligan was an or person. That's what she, they thought that her research meant, but it wasn't. What she was saying and what she was talking about was inclusion. Moving from a culture of or to a culture of and. We needed to be able to have work environments that supported both female traits and male traits. So much to the chagrin of many people, mostly my husband and children, after a year's worth of effort, and anyone who has done a PhD knows that that proposal feels like just as much work as the actual dissertation, after that class, I scrapped it and started from scratch. And instead, because I grew up in technology, I of course couldn't help but look around the room and realize my unconscious bias around, I was always the only woman in the room, whether it was grad school or was at my job at SAP. And I wanted to understand why. Because I'm a transformational leader, I focus in on the boardroom. That's where tone at the top is everything, right? That's where culture is. So my dissertation was on women who held board of director positions in publicly held life sciences and technology businesses. And this was about at the same time I started learning more about my grandmother and her family. My grandmother wasn't just orphaned. Her father died when her mother was six months pregnant with her. Um, when she was um, orphaned that day, her mother had heard that the soldiers were coming to their part of Harput in Turkey, that no longer is called that, in order to rid the village of Armenians. So her, her mother decided to sacrifice her life in order to give her children a shot. 
So she hid my grandmother, six months old, in a bureau drawer, hid her eight-year-old sister somewhere in the house, sent her 12 and 13-year-old daughters, the oldest girls, to a church to pray, and sent her sons with the other men in the village that they lived in to the mountains with rocks and sticks to be able to defend themselves. And then my great-grandmother was killed. Her, my Nana's sisters, the 12 and 13 year old, were in a church that was burnt down because the soldiers knew that there was one way in and one way out. When her sisters escaped, they were captured and they were given the choice, either die or marry two high ranking officials in the army. These men were in their 50s. So in order to save their family, their brothers and their sisters, they did just that. And because my grandmother was only six months old, they took her with them. And this picture is of my grandmother and her family when she escaped from, um, with one of the sisters from that um, compound she lived in with her sister and brother-in-laws. And that's her there in a refugee camp in Syria. So as I'm learning about these, my family, it's at odds with what I learned about these women, the women who made it to where so few people do, let alone women, and that's at the board. So what I learned about my family was these were women of strength. I mean, who can use their power to save their family and not be told that they are strong and endure a lifetime of that? But unfortunately, they were powerful but had no power. The women I studied, some of them came from, you know, tier one schools, connected families, but most of them came from humble beginnings, like I and probably most of you in the room come from. They used their thirst for innovation and for change. They used their grit to be able to turn every barrier into a strategy waiting to happen. Not one of them woke up in the morning thinking, hmm, who's going to oppress me today? It just doesn't work like that, right? And how many ladies here actually think that when they wake up in the morning? No, we think about what we have to do during the day and the, the things that we have to accomplish. So I thought, OK, that's my family legacy. I have a choice to make. So I decided because of the sheer luck of being born in America with how I look, that my job was to create a platform so that I could be the voice of change and enable other women to do the same. So there I was, really excited. I knew everything. I had so many friends in the tech world that are behind me. And the first thing I did was go to a tech conference that had the percentage even lower than 20%. In fact, it was between 5 and 8%. And the focus that I was doing was a panel where half the panel were women, half the panel were men, and we were talking about gender equity in the tech world. I thought everybody, these amazing people, some of whom I knew in the audience, they're innovators, they're good people, that they'd be on board. So there we were, my panel and I up on stage, I'm having the time of my life, I'm a big shot, yay, you know, I'm talking about this, everyone's gonna be all in, kumbaya at the end. I look up and I see people start streaming out. By half way through, half the room had left. By the end, the caterers and like a few event planners were in the audience and that was about it. Over the next few days, I started getting trolled. I started getting hate email, hate blogs. I took a bit of time, took a step back, licked my wounds and started reaching out to some of the people who were there and no longer were and were the loudest um, in opposition. And what I found out was I broke a cardinal rule. You see, although I knew and understood that the topic of gender equity in the workplace is a systems issue, right? That men don't need to be fixed, women don't need to be fixed. I made it about blame and shame. I didn't focus in on the system. So as I started to remember that, I realized that this truly is a cultural transformation, right? It's not just a change in what we do, it's a change in how we do it. And as I spoke, not only during my dissertation with the men on the board level, all the way down to individual contributor that helped me um, create and, and relive or have some really good connections after um, that conference with especially some of the biggest derailers, what I found was, with the hearts and minds where I could meet the men, right, who I needed at that table because this is a systems issue and a cultural issue and not a female issue, 
that they came to this topic with interest and passion when they had a daughter. And actually, research from Harvard just a few years ago shows that that is still true. But what have we learned over the last 18 months? We learned that we need more than that. Looking at the workforce, now finally having people who report to me, me having um, a place where I really do, my job does depend on all the best and available talent, I needed a new way of connecting with all decision makers, not just some. So how do we make that real? How did I turn all this passion, all this desire to change the way the world views women leaders and how they view themselves, and that is my mission, well, I started working with SAP and Success Factors on figuring that out. Success Factors is the HR cloud solution um, that SAP has. And so here's the challenge. There are 150 different unconscious biases at play in our brains just at work at any given time. 150. How the heck do you attack that? When you talk to most leaders about this topic and operationalizing it, they say, where do I start? How do I do that? Now, I combine that with some research from Dr. Elizabeth Kellen from Cranfield University, who found that that glass ceiling wasn't up where I put it at the board level, where it's most prominent in the workforce is at that middle manager level. Makes sense, right? They're responsible for the majority of your workforce. They determine who gets promoted, how people um, are treated, what you get paid, and those kinds of things last throughout your career. So how do you do that? Where do you start? We started thinking about where were those key decision points where those unconscious biases mattered the most? And how could we use technology to be able to enable the new behavior without the blame and shame? And our research found that it's these key decision points up here where you can do what's really, really important when it comes to unconscious bias decision interruption. It is completely impossible for any of us to be able to disrupt our own conscious bias because that's just how everything is. So let me give you an example of some ways that technology is going to start to change the way we do things when it comes to the people we have and how we leverage it, and most importantly, how we harness all the best and available talent. If I hear one more time from someone trying to hire a tech position and there are no women applying, and they say things like, well, I tried, I can't find anybody, I'm going to scream. We need to be in different rooms talking to different people about different stuff. And one way that we can do that, let's, let's see, let's start with who applies. Okay, so how many of you are people managers? Okay, so you've probably written a job rec or two before. Yeah, that's a pretty rote activity, right? We, we copy and paste or we focus so much on the job. Here's the thing, research tells us that there are thousands and thousands of words that attract or offend women and thousands and thousands of words that attract or, or offend men. So using emerging technology such like machine learning and augmented intelligence, because these are people decisions, not machine decisions, when you write a job description as a manager, you write it and all of a sudden the machine highlights a few words and pops up and says, hey, you might want to rethink this word. I think what you're going for is, and gives you some suggestions. It's not saying, shame on you, you're only going for white women, or shame on you, you're only going to attract men. It's simply giving you the option to rethink something as simple as a job description. But if we kept it there, and this is really important for business leaders, it can't just be about diversity and inclusion, it has to be about business excellence. It has to be about not only changing why we do something, but how we do it. So we also combine that with, or combining it with, um, let's see, industry information, like what does this kind of role go for, um, competitive information, do your competitors have this kind of role out there, um, how many job recs are open, all that kind of stuff, so that leaders can make fully informed decisions to truly harness all the best and available talent. The point here is we have the tools and the technology to be able to change this, not by only providing programs, right? We spend billions and billions on programs, education, all that kind of stuff, which is important, but that's too much of an or. 
coupled with something like this, where it's embedded in the how you lead your people all the way through this life cycle, asking these kinds of questions, we are bringing the mountain and meeting people where they are, which is the key point of transformational leadership. Meet people where they are in order to get them where you need them to be. Okay, so what does that mean for you? You know, I grew up in a really conservative family, and my father, especially, typical 1950s meat and potato kind of guy, and I grew up as a news junkie because from as early as I can remember, my dad and I would watch the local news and the national news. I grew up with Walter Cronkite, Peter Jennings. I felt like I knew them by, you know, personally by name. And we would watch, and during the 1970s, we'd see a lot of women marching in the streets and, and talking about um, the women's movement. And my father, who, mind you, hired many women, got them equal pay, promoted them because they deserved it, had this mindset because he thought, remember that women were pro, feminists were pro-women, anti-men. And he'd say things mostly to annoy me, like, hmm, if you women wanted equal rights, you'd open your own damn doors. And yes, I still roll my eyes. I can't believe I'm blood related to that. But then I also think, you know what? Oh, yes. And by the way, I love saying that when my dad's at a keynote and pointing him up and making him stand up. Um, oh, it's powerful. Talk about blame and shame. Um, but um, yeah, so, so when I think about that, I think, oh my god, my dad has a point. We can sit here and philosophize. We can theorize. We can wait for the women who I spoke with, right, at that board level, because again, it's tone at the top. Unless this is important to the top, it's not important anywhere. But we can wait for them, and none of those women, and since the 10 years that I have spoken with them, have been successful in bringing at least one more woman onto the board. So that tells you something, that we have some work to do. If we wait for them, we'll be waiting forever. It is time to take this into our own hands. It's time. It's time that we opened the door for ourselves. And I am not just talking about the women in the room. I'm talking about the men who are in the room and who are not in this room. To the men, I have to say, this is a door that we need you to open to. We need you on this topic. We need you in the room. We need you in the table, at the table. We embrace you. And what's most important is we've made room for you. So I'm going to ask you a question. If it's your job now to be the change you want to see, if it's your job to say, why would I do this? Why me? And instead interrupt that decision and say, why not me? Who's with me? Who's going to stand up right now and claim their platform to be the voice of change? Who's going to do it? Who's going to stand up? Come on, stand up. Stand up. Who's going to do it? It is time to open the door for yourself for career equity, but also to keep it open for the people who come behind you. Don't worry if you're just doing it for yourself. You're paving that path for the next person. Keep that door open so that all talent, no matter their gender, their culture, their race, they're differently abled, so that they can all pass through that door. And so that we, as a culture, as innovators, as disruptors, that we enable all of the best talent to thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. That was awesome and truly inspiring and just really practical. And I wish I had known your Nana. Um, so thank you so much for doing that. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. Our CEO, Ginny, always talks about how blockchain will do for trusted transactions, what the internet did for innovation. And we know that developers and investors, academics, uh, general public are increasingly interested in blockchain. And if you don't know enough about blockchain, tomorrow morning, 8.30, Mandalay Bay Ballroom, Bridget Van Kraligan, Senior Vice President of IBM, will be giving a fabulous talk about it. So do come and learn. Um, 
we often hear, when we hear about blockchain, we think about blockchain, we hear about the Bitcoin brothers, um, but we know that there are some extraordinary women who are so involved in shaping what this new generation of technology will mean for companies and individuals around the world. And it is my great privilege to bring up two extraordinary women who are shaping the future for all of us. Marie Week, uh, GM of blockchain for IBM, and also, uh, super exciting for me, Leanne Kemp. She's the CEO of a super, super cool company, Everledger. So let me invite you both on stage. Thank you, girl power. Thank you, Michelle. No? Yeah, thank you very much. So, very exciting time in the industry in blockchain. Um, I'm delighted to have Leanne here with us, who is the CEO of Everledger. And for those that might have been here last year, she presented on stage about her vision for how blockchain could transform uh, diamonds and how we could use it to really help with, you know, ensuring support for the Kimberly Act and it's been a very long journey, but the whole series, and, and if you look on her LinkedIn page, not only is she one of the coolest CEOs, you know, top 20 and all sorts of wonderful things that she's been honored for, to me, she's a trailblazer. That's the whole point. And it even says on her LinkedIn page, I promise my family this is my last startup. You know, she's a serial entrepreneur. Her story. And and I'm sure there's a good story yeah. behind that, so I'll, I'll wait for the, for the glass of wine to hear about that. But how did you, you know, to me, ideas are a dime a dozen. Actually doing something about them, especially in a new space with a new technology, is what really makes the difference. So how did you decide to jump in? What were the barriers? What gave you the courage to take those risks? Let's start with that question. There could be, is there a waiter with some wine? Because this is probably going to be a better interaction with a glass <laughs> in my hand. Um, but look, genuinely, I was on stage last year and it's, uh, it, it gave me the boldness and the confidence to move forward this year. But, but I'll, I'll sort of start back, you know, in the mid-90s, and now I'm showing my age. Um, the screen is probably showing a little bit more of my age right now. But um, I, I, began, I, began, <laughs> I began in, in RFID which is radio frequency identification. And, and you know, I didn't really start there day one out of school. I actually started there after my mum and my dad said, become an accountant, get a real job, do something that will make us proud. So I did, I tried, I went to a university, actually in far north Queensland, not because it was a good university, but it was because it was close to, close to the beach, beach and I could go scuba diving. Yeah. Um, but I dutifully went out, got a real job for about six months, worked in an accounting software business and decided, I don't really like accounting. <laughs> I don't mind computers, but... Um, Look at this. <laughs> rock star. Golly. See? One of the keys is if you ask for it, yes. it happens. Cheers. So, <laughs> Open your own door. So it started... Yeah, it's very true. <laughs> I'm not sure who's going to close it behind us, but it's going to be an interesting <laughs> ride. <laughs> so look, starting, in a, in, um, starting, t starting out in, you know, beyond school, trying to do the right dutiful thing with your parents and follow a normal career path, it didn't really fit with me. So I had to admit to myself that this is not the mold that my, um, my parents and even my family wanted for me. So why don't I just rethink what is potentially possible for myself, get my hands dirty, if my brothers can do this inside of their own bedroom and play with computers, then why can't I? And so I wind forward 20 odd years later and I've had a number of different career paths in my life, but I've always actually had my own business. So I knew what that, um, what that meant when I ended up in London and someone said I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, but over the course of 25 odd years, I'd um, implemented a number of emerging technology solutions in the space. Um, beyond diamonds, actually. My involvement in diamonds started in 2007. But it was in 2013 I started to see maybe the combination of my previous life skills could be put together and to solve a problem. And so I thought, that would kind of be cool. No one's doing it. Um, because I've been a software engineer for 20 years, I knew that if I thought something was possible, 
I had the skills myself to be able to write it, um, so I did. I wrote it at a hackathon in London, um, in the Google campus, and won the Innovation Award. But I, I had to really go further than that. <laughs> and so, it was, yeah, cheers for that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but I, I guess you can create anything these days with emerging technology, but the reality is, you have to be able to take the time to distill the technology to its purest and most potent form and understand beyond anything, it's actually not about the technology and sometimes it's not about the people, it's about understanding the timing and the rhythm of that timing. And so that was the piece, I think, that sort of came together for Everledger. And from there, once you had the timing, you understood the problem, you could bring together a future imagination and the, and the tools were available, then I guess the rest is sort of just mechanics. You know, it's like playing Sudoku. You're going to crack it one way or another. another. Eventually. <laughs> but so now in this, in this arena, all of the discussion, Michelle even raised it as well, you know, blockchain and bro culture, and we're going to create uh, a, a new Portopia, you know, in, in Puerto Rico now, and a bunch of other ideas. I actually see far more women in blockchain than I have in other emerging fields. There are leaders across the space, you know, certainly you, Blythe, Amber, I mean, there, there's many, um, and certainly a host in IBM and in our ecosystem as well. Why do you think it's different? Um, you know, um, th this is a, is a question you've just caught me on. So wh why do I think it's different? I, you know, I've just had a moment in time that I've realized Women do something really well. We have an, an inherent emotional intelligence. And I think over the course of the last 10 years and 20 years, we've also enabled ourselves to understand the importance of literacy. You know, we have to teach our children how yeah. to write and how to read. And we've recognized those that have come from a pseudo-technical role or have been involved in techno technical companies need to understand that we also have to have a digital intelligence. Right. And so those that have the experience or the maturity to be able to combine those together, I think we're able to advantage what the potential of blockchain can bring to next generation, not only for ourselves, but you know, for the next generation of our, our daughters, um, and of course, you know, for, for our grandchildren. But beyond that, blockchain is a network technology. It relies upon an ecosystem, a village, you know, to be able to bring that together. And inherently, we are, as women, our role is to to bring our arms together around something, to create a family, we bring that. So if we can sort of combine that inherent DNA that is us, that nurturing type, to bring together that, the equal base of equality, and we can transform that into a digital language and a digital platform, then why not? I think that, you know, that, that's really why I think this technology is different to others. And, and I personally agree with that. I think this is all about a team sport. It is a network and collaborating with different people in a network is something that I think really is what brings out the power. But I, I don't think it's limited just to technology innovation. You mentioned digitization. To me, the focus on the whole notion of whether this is man and women, right, or whether it's tech or business, to me, in a digital economy, every single company is a digital company, every single company needs to be a tech company. There's no separation between you know, the business and the tech anymore in order to be able to succeed. So I think the real question for this audience is how do you actually take that leap of faith to say, I'm going to try something new. Blockchain is a brand new technology. You've now, how many are we up to in terms of companies that you have <laughs> from a serial <laughs> entrepreneur perspective? So I've successfully exited three startups, um, and, and Everledger is my is my very last. So um, <laughs> promise to the no, we're, uh, we're only three years old. We're actually we turn three in the next week. In next week, we have 40 staff. And one thing that, I've, um, that I pride myself on in the organization is that we have 60% of our company are women. And those women um, in the organization, yeah, um, and, they, and they all hold some form of technical role or technical responsibility. Our project managers are not only you know, project leads that are responsible to make sure certain 
milestone events are achieved, they're deeply involved in constructing and architecting you know, APIs and swagger files. And look, they didn't come into the company with that skill set, but the reality is we have great open universities now, online libraries, open source technology. My young niece, who's six years old, writes like the baddest ass games um, on apps like you could never imagine. And I would never have thought that the age of sort of six and eight, you could sort of design these things and actually, and actually write it. So I, I think when you say, um, you know, what do you need to do to take a step forward or when should you have, just do it, right? <laughs> like put down the Mills and Boons um, romance novel and, and become interested in this digital intelligence. We need to have it in some form. We need to have it to be able to communicate with our children and our next generation. And so why not sort of put some of those tools, pick up a digital hand brush, um, you know, like a paintbrush and start to sort of create the imagination of where you want it to be. So just to close off in terms of advice for the rest of the team here, um, you know, my, my father immigrated to the country, started his own business. He said anything that you wanted to do, you could learn if, if you knew how to read. Now you don't even know, have to know how to read. You can watch a YouTube video, right? You can get onto a digital class. So having, I think, the courage to take that step, to try something new, you know, they've said that in the course of uh, a lifetime now for our kids, they're going to have seven careers and three of them haven't been invented yet. So everybody is going to have to focus on completely reinventing themselves all the time. How would you tell the folks here how to be their own entrepreneur for their own career? Um, I think, I, you know, when I, when I was young, we had this really great adventure book called Nancy Drew. I don't know if anyone knows. I think it's an yeah. American, yeah? I thought it was an, it's an American-based book. And I, I love the Nancy Drew books because you'd start on page one and then you would make a selection um, and you'd end up on page 29 and your life would look a certain way. Um, and I think that that's the beautiful thing about where we sit in the world today. We're standing on the shoulders of giants and women before us that have enabled us to have a voice in a platform like this, and thank you, IBM. You know, we've had great leaders in the space that just step forward. And what I found incredibly interesting is that, you know, we, women in the space are available. So Blythe Masters came into, the, um, came into the arena probably around the same time as I did, but little did I know, because I was from Australia, I didn't realize she was a Wall Street hero. And so I just like pinged her on LinkedIn. Hi, I'm kind of doing this thing in blockchain. Um, can you chat? She was like, absolutely. So I think these leaders are accessible. The issue is it's a fear, the fear of being rejected, the fear of not knowing. But we all have a certain level of literacy. We all have inherently within our nature the ability to connect. We all want to nurture. We nurture our children. So why not nurture yourself and take a step forward? I mean, we now jump off buildings with um, we know with parachutes, we jump off, you know, bridges with bungee ropes. I think that in life now we have enough knowledge around us, accessible knowledge, that even if you were to create a startup tomorrow, the failures are the pieces that actually make the greatness, um, which is what you can all sort of, you know, begin to sort of look towards. So I think it's actually as simple as saying, just take a sip and just walk forward. Go do it. Yeah. So what's next for you? What's, What's next on your plan? Um, Three years old, counting, lots of things coming out that you've shared with us. Yeah, we've, we're very excited about the, the, the kind of the potential of where um, the collective team and the collective mind that sits within Everledger, where we can take this forward. And I think one thing that we've created within the organization is to understand that it's okay to be able to operate in the unknown. And if we can sort of bring the confidence and the comfort around operating in the unknown, then anything is possible today. So we know that we've bought you know, transparency to probably one of the oldest industries in the world, a 500-year-old industry. And believe me, when I started, um, a lot of people said to me, I don't think this is possible. I think you're nuts. But the reason why um, it has been made possible is because I didn't listen to the tiny voices in my head. I certainly didn't listen to the people around me in the first six months. And I knew that I could do it, so I just did it. And now everyone's saying, wow, that was kind of a good idea, so we better do it too. <laughs> so my lessons from here, 
ask for help. Don't be afraid of rejection. Jump in and do it. And build a team around you that has the complementary skills you need. Yeah, and if you're trying to design an idea, just go for the top shelf, not the cardboard wine. Go straight for the top shelf. <laughs> Leanne, thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Marie and Leanne. That was awesome and, uh, and so practical. And I love that you asked for your wine. That was great. Um, so 20% of women in technology, 25% in management positions, leadership positions, 15% in C-suite and boardrooms. We're making progress, but it is agonizingly slow. And one of the things I've been writing about a lot lately is we will not be able to bend the curve alone as women. Progress requires not the half, but the whole. And so when I saw a video of our next speaker, I knew he needed to come and talk to us because he's as passionate as I am about men being part of this journey. Jeffrey Halter is the president of Why Women, a strategic consulting company that's focused on engaging men in women's leadership advancement, and he was formerly director of diversity strategy for Coca-Cola. So please give a warm welcome to Jeffrey Halter. <laughs> Too funny, too funny. I've never had a microphone fall off. I've had a shoe fall off before. Shoes, women's shoes. What could women's shoes possibly have to do with engaging men in women's leadership advancement? Well, believe it or not, first they represent discomfort, certainly for me at this moment. More importantly, they represent the discomfort that men have in even wanting to have a conversation around gender differences in the workplace. Second, they represent the different experiences men and women are having. Long before Dancing with the Stars, there was Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and Ginger was asked about Dancing with Fred. She said, Fred's an amazing dancer, but a woman is expected to do everything a man does, flawlessly dancing backwards wearing high heels. And I think this does a great job of articulating the fact that genders are having different experiences in the workplace. And then if we look at shoes as a representation of leadership, 17 out of 20 pairs still belong to men. 85% of senior leadership. Only three pairs belong to women. And if we move up to the C-suite, that drops to one pair. And so what I'll tell you is, if men are 85% of senior leadership, well, I think we're 85% of the problem, but we're also 85% of the solution. And so my goal today is to spend a few minutes with you and get you to go back and talk to your organization about the ready now men, those 30 to 40% of men that you can invite into this conversation who want to help you. And I know one of the themes is let's put smart to work. I'd like to say let's put smart women to work and smart men to work. But I'm actually going to ask you to do one less thing. I think it's time we stop asking women to lean in and we ask men to stand up. This is not a women's issue. We've heard this. This is an organizational issue. And so what I'm going to do is spend just a few minutes engaging with you on how to have a comfortable conversation around bringing men in to this conversation. And so I'm going to get comfortable. And yes, I'm taking the easy way out. And talk about the why. When you go back and talk to men, you have to talk in business terms. The why grow revenue by understanding our customers and consumers better. Improve operating profit through better talent management, better engagement, better innovation. Enhance your company reputation. Your reputation is under attack in social media, 
from activist shareholders, whether you know it or not. And it's what great companies do. I would have been so disappointed this morning if Ginny had gotten up and said, I want to make IBM the most mediocre company in America. This is a baseline expectation of what great companies do today. Let me tell you what it's not. It's not a journey. And you used journey right when I came up here. People go on journeys. But I hear a lot of D&I practitioners, diversity and inclusion practitioners, say our company's on a diversity journey. I was in sales for 20 years. I never went on a sales journey. If I didn't make my goal every quarter, they fired me. We cannot let this soft speak permeate this really important topic. It's not a nice thing to do. It's not a women's thing. And it's not a men lose, women win. According to NAFI, National Association of Female Executives, in this country, in best in class companies, two out of three promotions are still going to men. And in most companies, seven out of eight promotions are going to men. There is no factual proof that men are being disparately impacted by advancing women. Now, I've been a little hard on the men, so I want to acknowledge the men in the room. The five, ten men, raise your hands. Give them a hand. <laughs> Ladies, when you take over, and I know you will, remember we were here for you, this 50 of us. That being said, this is the last time we should applaud men for showing up at a women's leadership event. It should be an expectation of every leader in the organization. Yes. And I don't mean to pick on men, but as a business person, this is where the opportunity is. Mercer did a report, 3 million employees globally, and they said, which employees are the least engaged in diversity and inclusion initiatives? And the results, 39% of middle managers and 38% of men. Again, not to single them out. That's four in 10. I think that might be a good number. But as a business person, this represents the biggest gap that I have to close. You don't have to convince women and people of color and other underrepresented minorities that diversity is a good thing. You've got to convince these two groups and oh, by the way, they're the largest stakeholders in our company. So middle managers and men are critical to driving this change. And oh, by the way, best in class looks like 48%. That's a 25% 25 25 increase if we do this well. So what do we do? We engage and leverage women. Companies with more women on board, you know these numbers, 53% higher return on equity, 42% higher return on sales, 66% return on invested capital. Anytime we add women to the mix, we get incremental business results. Yet, we just don't want to talk about adding women at the board. But adding women to the board creates an organization where women are allowed to thrive and to prosper and drive exponential business results. So what do men need to do? Four simple things. Number one, listen. So many men want to start by leading, and they have no context. I coach men. I coach senior leaders. Take a woman to coffee and ask a simple question. Tell me what it's like to be a woman working here. And oh, by the way, you're not going to tell me anything. You don't want to be the flag bearer for all things women in the organization. And I coach them to ask again, what else don't I know? And you'll go a little deeper and then I say, ask one more time. And in that last 10 minutes, I'm going to hear root cause issues of bias that I did not know existed. And then I can start to change things. Then learn. Deepen your knowledge. How do you talk about the business case within your organization from a revenue standpoint? Our customers are changing. Women are sitting on 40% of purchasing desks. I do a lot of work with Department of Defense. There's all kinds of women there. We've got a lot of B2B customers here. Well, women are holding more and more IT roles. And there's a great Harvard Business Review study that says you can't show up with a bunch of 42 longs 
and expect to be successful today. So it's about our customers changing. And then lead. Now's the time to lead. And leadership looks like asking tough questions. Specifically three questions. Leaders need to ask, tell me how many men you lost last year and how many women you lost. I guarantee you have always lost more women. And as a leader, you can't take the answer when you're told, well, she left to spend more time with her family. Because 60% of women leave your company and go to work for a competitor or someone else in your industry or hang out their own shingle. They're leaving because of the company or the manager. Question two, what's your plan to engage more women next year? What's your plan? Simple as that. And then number three, how are you going to drive that down to middle managers and men? So that's it. That's the 80% head stuff. You're in a data business. It's about facts. It's about data. This is how we engage men. But advocacy lives in the 20% stuff. It lives in the heart stuff. And this is where will comes in. Advancing women today is actually a lot like diet and exercise. Everybody knows it's a really good idea, and yet we don't exercise and we still reach for the Krispy Kreme. <laughs> what I have found is will comes from personal accountability, this personal connection, and Patty touched on it. I'm going to take it a little deeper. It's men and women realizing that if we're not advocating for women today, we are betraying our daughters' futures. And I say this because I came to this very late in life. I'm a boomer, and uh, I wanted to raise a strong daughter. I really did. I encouraged her, whether it was soccer or art, music. I made sure my daughter went to a great college. And when my daughter graduates and makes 83 cents to my son, when my daughter is faced with the biases that I know exist in my company, when, I, when my daughter has to face Ron down the hall, who I know is a sexist, biased uh, individual, I choose to do nothing. I choose not to advocate for one of the most important people in our lives. The way we're going to drive long-term systemic change for women is to get a bunch of angry fathers to realize the responsibility that they have. Yes, thank you. So what does it look like? It looks like pledging your commitment. Please go to my website. There's no fee for this. Download, advocate, download the Advocating for Women initiative. You print out a form and you sign this. You commit to do one of 10 things, and here's the list of what that looks like. Put your daughter's name on it or a woman in your life's name on it, sign it, and put it up on your desk. It marks you as an advocate. And this visible, symbolic commitment is critical to driving change. And that's how we're going to drive change in this organization and in this company. And it's how we're going to make more money. And it's how we're going to be an employer of choice. So with that, I want you to leave thinking about shoes. Not size 14 red pumps, but all the shoes that our daughters are going to wear and the women in our lives are going to wear. And then go back and talk to the men and the women in their lives, in your lives, about the responsibility that they have. Thank you for your time. You can get a copy of this presentation. Reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. I didn't get a glass of wine brought to me. I didn't come up with one. So you can find me at the bar at the end of this. So uh, thank you very much. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need this? Great. Yes, I do. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. And I love the practical advice. This is a journey all of us can take together, which is what makes it so enriching and rewarding for my daughter and also for my son. Um, so first, let's give another round of applause to all the fabulous speakers, Leanne, Marie, Patty, Jeffrey, thank you all so much. Um, tomorrow we have a great agenda. Uh, there's plenty of things happening tomorrow, so be sure to show up. Uh, we've got some awesome IBM female leaders. I have the pleasure 
of leading the Women's Initiative at IBM for our 400,000 employees. And we have some of our best women doing self-defense courses and networking strategies and all sorts of other stuff. But tonight, it's time to drink and to network and to have fun. So I please invite you. There's signed copies of Patty's book. Um, there is social networking advice. You can have your headshot done, so you have a whole new profile. So get up, enjoy the evening, and uh, be with these other extraordinary, extraordinary women on the journey with you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.